Thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Dr. B has been talking to me for years, saying, you need to come. You need to meet my students. I want, to, want you to come see my college, and they need to hear about you and what you do. Um, I think you will find out pretty quickly. I'm very, very, very passionate about what I do. OK, before we get into all the nitty gritty stuff, today our topic is about traumatic brain injury and concussion, medical management um, throughout the whole healthcare spectrum, anywhere from the ER all the way out to outpatient rehab services, where I do a lot of my work. I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my sister said all these crazy things that I guess have happened over this past several years, but I just wanted to tell you my personal journey. Um, when I first went to undergrad at UCSB, I thought I was going to go into marine biology, and that quickly changed when I realized I get seasick so bad, and <laughs> really, really bad. And I did a couple internships, and I thought, this is just not going to work out at all. Um, then physical therapy somehow came into my lap. Um, someone had suggested, they thought, maybe that might be a good career for you. And the minute I read that description about what a physical therapist did, I said, wow, that's me. I love to stay fit. I love to be healthy. I love to tell people what to do. I like to help other people get better. Um, I'm so passionate about this. And when I told my mom, I think this is what I want to do, she said, you would be perfect at that. You've been bossing us around for years, telling us to eat healthy, exercise, get fit. So there was my path. Um, I went on to go to USC and got my doctorate in physical therapy. And then after working in a couple places, I thought this would be so great to have my own clinic. Ultimately, you know, the dream, I could have my own clinic and be a mom one day and treat patients, have a little bit of flexibility. And that was just a dream. But one day, really early on in my career, the opportunity came in my lap and I thought, I'm too green, I don't know what I'm doing. But I took the opportunity, I jumped, and it's been 11 years now that I've had my private practice with my business partner. And I'm really happy. It's hard work, but I'm really happy. Um, and I never thought in a million years that that would be me. I just didn't think that at all. Um, so your dreams can come true. Shoot for the stars or just take the opportunities. That's what I want to tell you. Take any opportunity that falls in your lap. Come talk to me after if you're interested in learning a little bit more about some of the work that I do. And um, I will leave my business cards out too. So I would love for you to reach out to me later on if something comes to you later on. Um, and then the other great opportunity that came up is years ago, some of my former professors said, we'd love for you to come and teach. And I was like, what? Who? Who are you talking about? Like, what? I don't even understand. I didn't even think that was an option. But I gave it a shot, and I love it. I have, in my sixth or seventh year of teaching at USC, physical therapy students in the um, sorry, at the school, but I teach year-round in my clinic. Uh, the students come to me. We train with our patients. I show them how to do the treatment. So that's all year long. And I've been doing that for many, many years. But that's my personal story. And I'm really passionate about neuro. So that's my area of specialty. Just like physicians, PT specialize anywhere from women's health, orthopedics, sports, neuro, pediatrics. I just fell in love with neuro. So you're going to see some of my patients here in these videos, and you're going to see me doing therapy with them. I just love it. I feel that I can help someone walk again, move, make some changes, drive some neuroplasticity in their brain. And I'm just super passionate about that. So I'm going to share a little bit about my story. Um, I teach neuropathology at USC, so I'm a neuroanatomy geek. I'm going to say that in advance. I love neuroanatomy, ne love neuropathology. We're definitely going to talk about patient examples, but I think it's super important that you understand the structure of the brain, what's happening, so this can make sense when you see the patients and you see my patient here and how he's changing. All right, so these are the objectives that just wanted you to have a little idea of some of the things that we're going to be covering today. We're going to distinguish between several different types of brain injury. There's concussion, subdural and epidural hematoma, and um, a couple others that I don't see right there, oh, contusions that we will be talking about. Also, we're going to describe some of the response categories. You probably see this on medical shows such as Gray's Anatomy, where they say GCS is 2, GCS is 10. I'm going to teach you all about that. Um, we're going to link diagnostic tests. So it's so important to know what type of test do you want to do when someone has a brain injury. Is it going to be an MRI or a CT scan, and why? And then we're also going to dis uh, describe medical management for treatment, all the way from the ER to outpatient. 
All right, and just to organize today's lecture, these are the three steps that we're gonna go through. We're gonna start with the neuroanatomy, pathogenesis, then we're gonna go into the disease course, clinical findings, and then in the end, we're gonna talk about medical management, prognosis, and clinical management. So for prevalence and incidence, TBI is very common in young males, three, three to four times more than women. Why do you think that? I'm hearing sports, I heard risky. Yeah, so I don't wanna stereotype at all. We have some <laughs> rambunctious women out there too, I'm sure, but men typically do engage in a little bit more risky contact sports behavior. So just um, as in TBI, spinal injury is the same. You're gonna see this very often in young males, 15 to 25, and the patient case I'm gonna show you today is my 22-year-old male patient who suffered a brain injury. And um, it's also very common in individuals over 65, and that's usually due to some type of fall, loss of balance, impaired balance. So you're gonna also see that as well. And then head injury occurs every seven seconds in the US. That's a lot if you think about it. Every seven seconds, there's a head injury out there. That's very common. The number one cause of brain injury is falls at 36%. And then motor vehicle accidents and either being hit by an object or your head hitting up against an object versus an object coming up at you is a close second. So those are kind of the three top injuries, um, how you can sustain a head injury. And then this just breaks my heart because I'm a mom and I love peds, but um, unfortunately there is a very high incidence of non-accidental TBI in the pediatric population. And that's just too sad. Um, it is a leading cause of death in children less than four years old. And in fact, 80% of children die from abuse, that end up dying from abuse are under the age of four. Um, so unfortunately, this is out there, this is real, and um, I really like this picture and this phrase here, children cannot stop child abuse, only adults can. All right, so now we're gonna get into the fun neuroanatomy part. So this is our brain. This is a skull, the layers that protect the brain. Are any of you familiar with these? Yeah, yay, good. Woo, I'm excited. Okay, so I'm gonna hope this works. Yay, the three meningeal layers. And the mnemonic that I use to remember that is PAD. Pia, arachnoid, and dura mater, PAD. Okay, so those are gonna be right here. The Pia mater, lowest, oops, I've got this. We've got the Pia mater down here. The arachnoid mater and the dura mater is right on top. Okay. And then the very important thing to note with brain injury is where the potential space is that bleeding occurs. So there's two potential spaces here. It's gonna be either the epidural space, which is above the dura mater, and that's gonna be right between the dura mater and the skull right here, okay? And the second space is gonna be the subdural space right here, right below the dura mater. So those are the really only two major potential spaces that you can have bleeding with a brain injury. Okay, so this next image is a series of the brain over here, the skull, and then the contents within the skull here. And we're gonna go through each image in a little bit more detail. The first picture over here is depicting the lobes and the whole brain sitting within the skull. This part here is depicting the folds of the dura mater. That's the, that's the meningeal layer that's on the top. There's actually folds within the dura mater, and that's these two folds here. And then here is a notch in which brain tissue typically gets pushed down when there's a head injury. All right, so this image, if you can see a little bit closer, this is showing, we have our brain here. This is the anterior side, the front. You can see the nose and the chin, the jaw. What's important to note here is the frontal lobe right here sitting in the anterior fossa and the cerebellum and the brain stem sitting right here in the posterior fossa, so that's back there. 
That's how the brain sits in the skull. All right, next, these are two of the most important folds of the dura mater. So the fox cerebri, this fold right here, actually sits in your brain like this. It sits vertical, and it separates the right and left side of the brain, okay? And then the second largest fold is the tentorium cerebelli, and that actually sits in the horizontal axle plane right here. So your brain has these folds that sit like this, and they have many compartments around them. So those are the two most important folds within the brain. All right, now within that axial fold of the brain, which is a tentorium cerebelli right here, we have what's called the tentorial notch. And really the most important thing to note here is this is a typical notch where when there's any type of head injury, you're gonna have brain tissue pushing down into that notch, and that's just one of the most common spots. So imagine, you have all this swelling after a head injury, the tissue needs to go somewhere, it typically pushes right through that tentorial notch. So that's the main purpose of this slide here. Now the analogy I wanna use so that you can kind of get a better understanding of, so what, what's the point of all of this? Why, Dr. Dadul, are you telling me about all these fox cerebris and these folds? I want you to understand what's really happening in the brain when you have a brain injury. So imagine our brain is like a house, okay? And the skull is the walls of the house. Now, if there's a flood and there's a burst in a pipe, which is blood, and the house is just filled with water, all the furniture, everything is just gonna get pushed out and down, right? If you have a flood, there's nowhere else to, for anything to go but out and down. That's the exact same thing that happens in the brain. It has rooms, it's compartments, it's got the skull, like the architecture of a house, and the only place that the brain tissue can go is down and out, and that's a herniation, a brain herniation, when the tissue pushes out. So it's really important to note that that's just what's happening in the brain when we get increased pressure and increased swelling. All right, any questions about that? Okay, oh yes. Typic so the brain, that's a very good question. The question is, can it push up? So what's gonna happen is your brain tissue will swell and that will push up, but because the skull is so hard, just like the walls of your home, there's nowhere for it to go. There's nowhere for it to go. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna die unless you get release of that tissue. So eventually, all it can do is go down and out. But I'm gonna to talk to you about surgical interventions, how to relieve that from pushing up with actually removing the skull, okay? Good question. Okay, so we talked about all the neuroanatomy, now we're gonna get into the really fun stuff, the patient case. All right, so this is my patient, Steve. He is a 22-year-old male, and he came to me in July of 2013. He had a head injury. The family came to me, um, they're a beautiful family. We had the cousin who acted like a brother. They came, they all, aunt, brother, sister, cousin, the whole family came to me. This patient had suffered such a traumatic head injury, he could not even sit at the edge of the mat. So imagine I've got this gym with all these mats. He couldn't sit here at the edge of the mat without being completely slumped over, his head was down. I had to hold him to sit on the mat. That's what bad shape he was in. We don't know exactly what type of head injury he had or what happened. I know he was a boxer and his friends were very vague about the injury. They just pretty much said, I, we don't know what happened. And obviously that's probably not the case. So either he fell or someone assaulted him. We don't know for sure, but all we knew is we were gonna get him better. So they came to me and they said, hello Manjuri, we would like for you to help us get Steve to walk again because Steve could not speak for himself. He had lost his voice, he wasn't able to communicate. And in my head I'm thinking, oh man, this man, this man can't even sit. How am I gonna get him to walk again? But I, I won't give up. I will give everyone 150% of my effort. And I said, if you wanna walk, we will try, but I'm also realistic. And I said, we have to take steps to get to walking. He must sit first before he can walk. He must hold his head up before we can walk. But the family worked really, really hard. The patient worked really hard. We were a team. And I will show you Steve's progress as we continue on with the lecture. Um, some of these other things, he had a status post craniotomy. So there was drilling within his skull to relieve the pressure of the swelling tissue and the blood. 
and max assist times two to stand. That's two people just completely lifting and holding him up to be able to even stand for a few seconds. In this video here, Steve is sitting, I think this is just a few months after working with him. If you can see now he is sitting with his back away from the chair. He's holding up his head, granted it's tilted, but I'm also mirroring what I want him to do. So he's tilting his head and I'm gonna play an audio for you and you can hear him speaking. So it's so exciting, he's sitting, he's using his trunk muscles, he's holding his head up and now he's speaking and communicating with me. That's huge, that is huge after what he had been through. He was in a coma. So hold on, let's see here. We're counting in Spanish and English. Okay, so I don't know if you could hear, I was way louder than he was, but he was saying his numbers and that's really, really exciting. The other thing I just wanna tell you about this is I did check my notes here and this is three months after working with Steve. So in just three months, we went from Max Assist sitting at the edge of the mat to this beautiful picture of Steve sitting, holding his head and speaking. And then the other thing I wanted to tell you is this was 15 months after his ori original injury. And why this is important, I'm gonna tell you about it more, but you will hear this with, um, you'll hear this out in the community, and this is what the literature does say. You're gonna see the most recovery within the first six months of your injury, okay? And I agree that you're gonna see a lot of recovery within the first six months, but there's a lot that we can do as healthcare professionals to help our patients get better even after that time. So I just want you, that's one of the big take home messages. I had one patient, one little sidebar story, but it just touches my heart. When I was working in inpatient with a patient with a spinal cord injury, he was on a ventilator because his injury was so high up that he couldn't breathe on his own. And some doctor had told him, you have a 1% chance of recovering, walking, whatever the doctor told him. So his family painted this huge poster and put it right up in his hospital room. And he said, we are the one percenters. And, you know, that just touched my heart. I still remember that many years ago. And I think it's our job as healthcare professionals to say, no, we can do more. We can work hard with our patients. We can motivate them and we can get them better despite what the doctors say, despite what the literature may say. We have to at least give it a try. So it's important to note this was 15 months post his injury and he was also told he may not recover. These are the types of pathogenesis that can occur with brain injury. So this is what could actually cause a brain injury. There are several different types of pathogenesis. It's not just a straightforward, you have a brain injury, there's some bleeding. It's where is the bleeding? What's the extent of the damage? What's happening? We are going to be talking about the bottom four today, and we'll go over those in more detail. So with brain injury, as with spinal injury and several other injuries, there's always typically two types of injuries. You have your primary injury, which is a result of a direct insult or some type of mechanical injury on your brain, but that's just the primary. Really where all the damage happens is the secondary events. So that's a whole cascade of events. That's the inflammation, edema, um, all, of, all of the secondary effects that you're familiar with, the alteration in blood flow, changes in metabolism, that's where the real brain damage occurs. 
So these are some of the common signs and symptoms that you would see in a traumatic brain injury. Headache, possibly a loss of consciousness, if not maybe an altered consciousness, impaired balance, dizziness, sleep impairments. There is a lot. And this is typically what you'll see early on in a brain injury. Now, these are the potential late signs. So early on, you might see the loss of consciousness, dizziness, headache. But then as patients slowly recover, these are some of the residual effects that you're going to see. So we can see some patients may stay in a coma or they may recover, and there's a whole spectrum. You see a lot of cognitive impairments with traumatic brain injury. You're going to see personality changes, executive function impairments, memory issues. Many, many of my patients have a lot of cognitive impairments. So I'm working with them. I need to understand what's their learning style? Um, what, what can they recall? What can they remember? And I'm challenging them. I'm doing dual task activities. So in addition to sitting or walking, just like with Steve, I'm having them try to think about different things to really use their brain and work on this whole cognitive impairment area. And then focal neurological signs are speech impairments, vision impairments, motor impairments. And again, these are all some of the late signs and symptoms with TBI. This slide here, if you can, if, if this makes sense to you, this is just a very general disease course of brain injury. And I say that because it's, you can have a concussion or a very mild brain injury to something very, very, very traumatic. But I wanted you to have an idea of what happens on that timeline. What does this look like? So try to think about a very mild brain injury to a very traumatic brain injury. But this is just the steps we're going to go through. So at first, there's some type of head trauma. And it's going to be either open or closed. You know, you can hit your head and completely bleed out on the inside without having any open head trauma. There may or may not be a loss or altered consciousness. And then if it's determined that it's needed, you're going to have some type of immediate C scan, a CT scan. And that's going to be for the patients that are more moderate to high risk, not necessarily the low level patients. You can, get a, you can have a brain injury or a mild concussion and not necessarily need imaging. So the imaging is really only for the patients that are at a higher risk. Um, if there is not significant damage, you can just have conservative treatment. You don't necessarily need surgical intervention that's going to be needed for these higher risk patients. Uh, decompression and craniotomies, those are just different types of surgical interventions. We'll be talking about that a little bit later tonight. And then we talked about most recovery occurs within six months. I have to say that because that's what the evidence shows. But I'm going to fight that every day until I retire. And then I'll tell my students and all the clinicians I train, they need to keep fighting it. Um, and then this is the end. Some remain in a comatose state. Some of my patients end up in a chronic disability. Maybe they unfortunately never can walk, or maybe they always have to use a walker and braces. And some people make really good continued recovery over and over again with intense rehab. So this is just a general disease course for brain injury. So this is the Glasgow Coma Scale, the GCS. This is the most common scoring system used to describe the level of consciousness in a person following a traumatic brain injury. What's nice about this test is it's simple, it's reliable, and it correlates really well with outcomes for a brain injury. Okay, So once you get this score for your patient, and this is usually within the ER, you have a very good idea of what the outcome of the patient's going to look like. And that's, that's kind of exciting instead of this complete unknown. Granted, there's so many other factors. But typically, the GCS is very reliable. And it's going to tell you what this patient's going to look like later on, even though they're in the ER and it's very traumatic. Okay, So there are three response categories. Got to keep this fun. We've got the eye-opening response, the verbal response, and your motor response. So I have a few questions for you. What does a low score on the GCS here indicate regarding the level of consciousness? A low score, what is that going to tell us about the level of consciousness of the patient? 
little to none. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a very low level of consciousness or maybe loss or no consciousness. That's a low score, okay? Now, what does a high score on this um, scale, what does a high score on the Glasgow Coma Scale indicate regarding prognosis or outcome for a patient? I think I heard good. Yeah, good prognosis. So if you have a high score, if you are responding to verbal stimuli, you're oriented and you're obeying commands, your GCS score is going to be very high. There's a very good chance you're going to have a very good outcome and a good recovery. Yay, that's what we want. So now that we have a better understanding of the pathogenesis, I want to review some of these in a little bit more detail. We talked about the primary injury, the secondary injury. Now we've got to get into the nitty gritties of each of these. So the first two we're going to talk about are cerebral contusions and hemorrhages. Cerebral contusions are pretty much bruising of the brain, okay? And the most common, this is, this is very commonly seen within elderly, but it's also commonly seen with coup and contra coup injuries. So the coup injury is where you have the initial impact. That's where you're going to have that initial injury on the inside of your skull. Now the contra coup region is going to be on the opposite side of the brain. So typically patients get hit in the frontal lobe here. That's the coup injury and then the head whips back. It hits a brain. That area can also get injured. That's a contra coup injury. What's interesting about this is it can occur either separately or they can occur together. It just it just depends on the nature of the actual injury itself. But with coup and contra coup injuries, that's where you see these cerebral contusions, bruising in the brain, okay? Now hemorrhages down here, I like to think of those as leaking pipes. So our blood vessels are just like pipes. They can either burst, they can leak, and that's exactly what a hemorrhage is. It's just a leaky blood vessel or a burst in our blood vessel causing um, brain, um, blood to come outside of the vessels and push into the brain. So the most common sites for contusions are the inferior frontal lobe, which is underneath here, and your temporal lobe, which is on the side of your brain. I think this image, C, is the inferior, well, I, I don't think. I think this image gives you the best idea of what I'm trying to explain to you here too, but this is an inferior view of the brain. This is the front, the anterior, and the posterior view. So if you can picture you're at your feet looking up into your brain. So this is the inferior frontal lobe, and on the sides are your temporal lobes. So those are the two most common sites that you're likely to get a um, contusion. Now, I had to obviously put a picture of my children. These are my three very spirited children. Um, I put them in here because every time I do this lecture and I think about the inferior frontal lobe, it reminds me when my kids get their helmets on and they need to ride their bikes, and I say, can you please just tuck that helmet down a little bit more? You know, we have our helmets and they kind of drift back a little bit here. And that's not going to cover your frontal lobe at all. So I'm like, everyone needs to cover their frontal lobe, cover your frontal lobe. And that's my helicopter mom way of making light of the situation, having them remind each other. They feel pretty cool that they're using some neuroanatomy terms. So I always laugh still when I hear the word Zane, cover your frontal lobe. Mom said so. So, so they've got it down. They're really good at it. And here's our latest addition. She's in training. You know, Minnie's drifting a little bit back here, but she's going to get it. They will be reminding her for sure. So hematomas. Hematomas are a collection of blood outside of the vessel that displaces the brain. Okay, so we have our blood vessel. A hematoma is going to be a lot of blood collecting and pooling, and it's going to push the brain. All right, what I want to share with you here is these are the two most common types of hematomas. You're going to hear epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma a lot today. And I'm sure when you leave here and you're out in the community, you're watching TV, people are talking, you're going to hear these two terms. So it's kind of important to know. And this could be a cool party trick to be like, I know what a CT scan epidural hematoma is going to look like because I guarantee you will know when we're done today. So. The epidural hematoma right here, 
the common pattern that you're gonna see is a bulging shape, okay? That's really important. You can see that the blood is bulging and pushing into the brain. And what's really, to me, what's really fascinating about this is the reason that it's pushing into the brain is because this is the dura mater. Remember that's a meningeal fold that's all the way at the top of the skull? Imagine this dura mater right here is a piece of duct tape, okay? That duct tape is so tight, it is stuck to the skull. It's holding onto those sutures very tight. Now, if blood starts pooling, duct tape is so strong, it doesn't wanna let go. So the only place for the blood to go, because it's dura mater is holding on so tightly here, the blood pools and it only can push into the brain. Does that make sense? So it's holding on really tight. Picture the dura mater's duct tape. Blood is pooling, pushing into the brain, so you get this bulge. Now, in contrast with a subdural hematoma, the dura mater is not affected because it's sub. We are below the dura mater. So that duct tape can stick to the skull all night long. There's no issue there. Now the blood is going to pool all around the skull in a crescent shape. And that's because it's not sticking to the skull. It has plenty of room to just blood flow. Okay. And really with this picture, I just wanted to show you, again, we talked about this already, the meningeal layers. I just wanted to show you that in the subdural space right here, it's very common that you'll see this bridging vein, which are these blue veins right here. They're gonna pool right underneath the dura mater. And that's, that's the main common vein that gets affected when you have a brain injury. So to talk about them a little bit more, Subdural hematoma has two main categories. You can either have an acute subdural hematoma, which is a new injury, or you can also have a chronic subdural hematoma, which is an old injury. And they're very different from each other. So the acute subdural hematoma here is typically associated with some type of traumatic injury. Again, we don't know what happened to my patient Steve, but it's very likely that he had an acute subdural hematoma. I think there was trauma of some sort, either an assault or a fall. And 50% of those patients experience a loss of consciousness at their injury. And then chronic subdural hematoma is completely different. So this is very fascinating to me. These are very slow symptoms that develop. Usually there's no evidence of trauma. It happens very common in elderly patients. But what's interesting is there's typically no evidence of trauma, but many patients, they, well, they may, they may not remember a slight fall, a little bump to the head. And what happens is based on the structure of our blood vessels, they could get some shearing and tearing and just a slow, slow bleed. So typically there's no huge traumatic event, but they could bump their head, they could have a little fall. Um, and what happens is they have these slow symptoms that develop for weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks. So what's interesting about that is a patient may come to you and say, I have a headache, nothing, I didn't fall, nothing happened. But this is something you should think about, especially in that age bracket and if the symptoms are slow to develop. And headache occurs in 80% of patients. So it's very common to say, oh, I just have a headache. But um, as a physician, as a, as a healthcare practitioner, as a doctor of physical therapy, a patient comes to me and says they have a headache, I'm thinking that they could potentially have a chronic subdural hematoma if they meet the criteria. Um, and then the other thing that's a little bit tricky with this one is there's typically also an altered, uh, altered mental status. So what's challenging for the differential diagnosis is in that age category higher than 60, it could be mistaken for an Alzheimer type dementia. So this one's a little bit of a tricky diagnosis and it's very different than the acute subdural hematoma, which is a very traumatic injury. All right, now with the epidural hematoma, again, that's above the dura mater. That's where you get the bulge. Um, that's gonna be very common with trauma as well. So Steve may have also suffered an epidural hematoma. So it was either maybe an acute subdural hematoma or an epidural hematoma, very common in young adults, and this can lead to very severe brain injury. You are so close up there in the skull, if there's all that bleeding happening and there's nowhere for that to go, it doesn't get released with surgery or some type of an intervention, um, 
death is, mortality rate gets very, very high if that's not treated very quickly. Okay. All right, so what type of imaging is required to determine the extent of damage? So a CT scan is a quick, most cost-effective, emergent image of choice. You can really tell quite a bit about where the damage is. You can see the bulge. You can see the crescent shape. You can see what areas of the brain are affected. And typically, that's a quick thing that you can get done as soon as you have your head injury so that they can determine if surgery or what type of intervention needs to be done. Now, an MRI, on the other hand, that's more costly. It is going to tell you about more subtle injuries, but it's going to take longer to get done. It's going to be more costly. And if you have an emergent situation, you just need to get in there and get that CT scan done in case you need a craniotomy or a craniectomy or some type of treatment. So CT scan originally and then potentially MRI if the CT scan doesn't show anything and you need to see some more subtle um, injuries. So for example, a more subtle injury I could tell you about would be the contusion. Think of my kids with the helmet, that's contusion. Brain bruising, you may not see that on a CT scan because it's not this huge bleed, right? You're not gonna see the crescent shape, the bulging shape, just maybe a little bit of bruising. That you might be able to tell more with an MRI than a CT scan. So that's just kind of, if your patient's still having issues and nothing shows up on the CT scan, they may need to jump then and do the MRI. Okay, so these are CT scans. And this one on, the, on your right is an acute subdural hematoma. And that's gonna be that crescent shape, very characteristic of subdural hematoma. And we have our bulge for our epidural hematoma. It's gonna bulge right into the brain. All right, now, I'm gonna test your knowledge. I think you can do it. I know you can do it. Do you think that this image on your left is a epidural hematoma or a subdural hematoma? Okay, so this image here, we're either looking for a bulge or a crescent shape. And you can have a large crescent shape too. It's, it's, it's a brain, it's irregular. So you could be a bulge, it could be a large crescent, it could be a small crescent. Show of hands, how many of you think that this image over here is a subdural hematoma? Okay, and how many of you think it's an epidural hematoma? Okay, I'd say maybe more said subdural but a close second was epidural. And how many of you were like, Dr. Dadul, I, don't, I can't read a CT scan. That's fine, that's fine. That's completely normal. All right. So that is actually a pretty big subdural hematoma. And that, I can see that would be a little tricky because it was bulging out, but it was just a really big bleed, okay? How about this image here? Let's try it again. Okay, how many of you think that this image on this side we're either looking for a crescent shape, which is a subdural hematoma, or we're looking for a bulge, which is an epidural hematoma. How many of you think it's subdural hematoma, which is a crescent shape? I'm seeing more hands, which I'm excited about. Okay. How many of you think it's an epidural hematoma with a bulge? Okay, sub, I think there were more subdurals. So before I throw the image up, I'm gonna show you this is the crescent shape. It's very characteristic, it's very defined, and we're not gonna get into too much radiology detail, but with a bulge, it's gonna just be a bulge, it's just gonna go somewhere, but crescent shape is really gonna really come around on the brain here. But there's our crescent shape right there. So they were both subdural hematomas. Okay, so now we are down to our final pathogenesis of today's topic. So concussion. How many of you have experienced a concussion or know someone who has experienced a concussion? Yeah, that's, a, that's like probably three-fourths of you. 
Um, I'm in that category too. I've unfortunately experienced two concussions. I have many friends who've experienced many concussions, many patients with friends. So this is gonna resonate um, with a lot of us. So a concussion is a brain injury. It is, it's actually a brain injury. It's not in its own category. It is a brain injury. What's interesting about that is there's typically no structural damage that happens in the brain. It's not like the epidural and subdural hematoma. It's more of a metabolic and pathophysiological process. So the increased metabolism, inflammation, neurons not firing properly, that's what's happening in the brain with a concussion. So you're not gonna see a crescent shape. You're not gonna see a bulging pattern. It's more of a pathophysiological process, okay? Typically, you're gonna have some type of alteration in consciousness, and it's gonna be brief. It's gonna be less than six hours. That's typical. And it's gonna be a very rapid onset. So for those of you who've actually experienced it, it's probably quick. You feel all these symptoms and then everything kind of resolves. And the jury's still out on how long that takes to actually resolve. There are over 46, 46 working definitions on concussion. This is one of my favorites. So this is with the International Conference on Concussion in Sport in the, uh, the Zurich team that met recently. And I like the way they put this. They said that concussion is a complex pathophysiological process affecting the brain induced by biochemical traumatic forces. Just kind of take a look at that. That's what's happening in the brain when you have a concussion. And I'm sure you've heard there's so much emerging research on CTE and concussion within the last two years. And this year, I, it's just blowing up every month or something new. Even today, something new came out that I'm gonna tell you all about. I just saw it in my news. I'm like, what, I'm talking about this today. This is exciting, something new. Um, I do wanna share with you a really nice video. I don't know if you've seen this before, but essentially it's what happens in a football player's brain when they have a concussion. And I thought this was a really cool video. And now you know all the neuroanatomy, so you're gonna watch this video and say, there's a fox cerebri. And there's a frontal lobe, and you're gonna know all about what's happening here in this brain. All right, I don't think there's sound on here, so you just get to enjoy it. There are sensors in the helmets now for research. Our brain is like jello. Coup injury. There's that fold of the dura mater. Sits like this.
and that is it. Okay, so we talked about this, a concussion, just like you saw in that video, there was bruising and damaging of the brain and the brain tissue was moving around like jello. There wasn't any formal bleeding. So concussion is more of a physiologic metabolic disturbance, not a structural injury. So neuroimaging is typically gonna be negative. CT scans, MRIs, they're not gonna really tell you much about a concussion, okay? Resolution of clinical and cognitive symptoms. The research says, the research says typically concussions resolve within 10 days up to two weeks. I'm still working hard to find a concrete number, but right now all I'm hearing is typically concussions heal within 10 days to two weeks. So the question is what were the football players diagnosed with before CTE? This is still, the, the research with CTE is still very new. So I think a lot of players are actually either self-diagnosing themselves or they're just showing a lot of different neural damages and they're not given a straight diagnosis because right now we're being told that you can only detect CTE on autopsy after death. Okay, so before that, they're typically not giving them really any diagnosis. They may say you have multiple concussions with a lot of damage. I don't know that physicians are giving them a concrete diagnosis. Not to my knowledge, yes. Was there just today actually a, a football player that they found something while he was alive but had passed away today and I guess they did like an autopsy on him? Yes. That's exactly what I read this morning. So tell me your name. Devin. So Devin just brought up the cool news that came out today. This was the first time that they detected what they say is evidence of CTE in a living patient. So they did all their scans. There's a research study going on. And we've always said literally up until yesterday that I knew of, you can only detect CTE on autopsy. So we're going to talk a little bit more about CTE in a few slides. But yes, that's the new news that came out today. So that is exciting. But there have been several ex-NFL players who before they died said, I know I have CTE. As soon as I die, you do the autopsy on my brain and we'll confirm it. And we, are, we will talk about those. Okay, so as I said, typically a normal standard concussion will heal within 10 days to two weeks, okay? And that's about 85% of patients. So these are the long-term consequences. So as I stated, most concussions heal within 10 days to two weeks, and there are several long-term consequences. So one of them is unfortunately post-concussion syndrome. I've also heard persistent post-concussion syndrome, which is P PPCS. And this occurs within 15% of patients who don't recover spontaneously from a standard concussion. And you get persistent symptoms such as headache, dizziness, insomnia. Those are the top three that I hear with my patients. And this can last, unfortunately, several months to years. But there are treatments, so if you want to chat with me after, there's a lot of vestibular treatments because a lot of this is happening within the brain and the inner ear and with orthopedic treatments for your cervical spine. So there are emerging treatments that can help with a lot of the signs and symptoms there. Um, another one, we won't go into too much detail today, but there's also something called second impact syndrome down here. It's still a little bit controversial. It's seen more in children and teens, but with this one, it's a rare reports of when you have an original concussion and when that one has not healed and you get another concussion, you can get very severe brain swelling because the brain just does not know how to auto-regulate and, and manage those two concussions have been so close to each other. And so you can get some serious brain swelling with that one. And our next topic is CTE, the hot topic. So as I stated, at present, there's a lot of emerging research on CTE. Um, there was a movie, Concussion, with Will Smith. Um, the uh, Frank, Giver, Frank Gifford over here, a legend in football, announced that he suffered from CTE prior to his death. And that was indeed confirmed on autopsy. So CTE, essentially what this is, is it's linked to repeated blows to the head and concussions. It's been detected in many ex-NFL players in most recent years. 
And essentially, it's a cumulative effect of multiple hits to the head, multiple concussions, and that's going to lead to progressive deterioration of neural tissue. Our brains just can't handle all of that damage and that repeated damage. So the symptoms I'm sure you've heard of with a lot of the football players that have suffered this, there's aggression, personality changes, motor impairments, and some of them are very similar to Parkinson's disease. So they get this flexed forward shuffling gait pattern that's very characteristic of Parkinson's disease. Um, and several have committed suicide, unfortunately. It's just a really, really sad one. Depression, aggression, memory changes, really sad. And as Devin and several of you have read and seen, up until today, it's the first that I'm hearing, we have the first living patient that has evidence of CTE in their brain. So I think this is really exciting because these players need to get diagnosed with CTE and we need, we need to either take them off the field, get them the help that they need and say, this is real, this is happening and not wait till autopsy. But I do wanna note the research is still in its infancy. This is still very new. So we're still just trying to tip the iceberg and find out what exactly is happening with CTE. All right, another hot topic is genetic susceptibility to concussions and brain injury. And this is also a very hot topic with a lot of emerging research. We're just trying to get our hands on it and make sense of it. So what's interesting here is genes may cause some people to actually be more susceptible to a concussion or some type of trauma than other people. A person's genetic makeup, in fact, may play an important role on the extent of the injury and the number of blows that they sustain. Now, the tau gene is a protein. A new study is finding that players who had their blood work taken after they had a concussion, those who were cleared to return back to play had less of the tau protein in their blood than those who were not recovered to play. So we're finding that there's a connection with the tau protein. If you have more of this, you're more likely to have a concussion, have trauma, and not recover as well. So what's neat about this is they can do some blood work and detect these genes and see if you should return back to play or even they're working on a blood test to determine if you should even engage yourself in contact risky sports. So I've heard I've heard that parents could eventually be able to get their children tested to see what type of tau proteins they have, some of these other proteins, and decide, should my kid play football? Should my kid do rugby or whatever sport you want to do? And make those decisions with some really concrete scientific knowledge, which is really shocking to me that that's happening. Now, is it really just a gene? I don't think so. I think it's an interaction, most likely an interaction between your genes, your susceptibility, and also the injury itself. Now, this is some newer information too. Alzheimer's disease and the connection with concussions, that's been around, but I just read an article that it could be linked to MS. So there was a big study done in Sweden saying that several of their patients who had suffered multiple concussions, they had later on had an increased chance of getting multiple sclerosis. So um, be on the lookout. All of this will be coming out. So the tau, I believe the tau protein is linked to Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think it was MS as well. I think that was more for the tau versus a polypo protein. But I'm still learning that too because a lot of that is new information coming out to us. Okay, so from a medical management perspective, what are you going to do? On the field, there's a test called the Sports Concussion Assessment, the SCAT, and that's an on-field assessment. And what's really neat about this is we've been so proactive that many physical therapists and sports medicine doctors are actually doing these tests on the pediatric population in particular. I'm sure they're doing with it adults too. They're getting baselines of this test. So Patients are coming in, they're getting screened, and we're checking their cognition, their balance, their function, baseline, before you even have an injury. Then that way, when there's an actual concussion, you can compare the two tests to see if there's really a change. So I like that. 
Um, then you're going to have some type of follow-up either in the ER or with your physician's office, depending how bad it is. And then I'm sure all of you are pretty familiar with this. Um, we typically talk about a graded return to physical activity. You know, back in the day, it was tough it up, get back in the field. Now it's let's have you slowly start walking, start exercising, start doing your activity. It's going to be graded to get back. Now with children, a little bit of more special care is required. Why do you think that? Why do you think children are different than adults? They're still growing, yeah. Anything else? Growing? All the neurons haven't formed. They don't have complete myelination. Their metabolism is very high, which could, re, uh, which could cause increased inflammation. Um, their cranial bones are not as firm and as hard and as tight, so that can change too. Um, there's just a lot of different things that we need to consider in the pediatric population. So you can be a pediatric specialist. So the question is, at what age do you think it's appropriate to have your child go in for baseline testing? Well, I think if they're going to start to play a sport, let's say just basic AYSO soccer, and they're six or seven years old, you can do the testing on them, but they're still developing and growing. So what if they don't get an injury until they're eight or nine? Developmentally, they're going to be very different, but I think it doesn't hurt. And I think to be proactive, you should go ahead and do that, absolutely. Um, and I think pediatricians are on board with it. We as physical therapists are going to the pediatric clinics and telling them we will do testing. I'm even bringing on my students to help do clinics to do free testing. So doctors can't really say no to that if we're going to do some free testing for them. But that is a good question. Um, I did want to bring up, because you had mentioned at what age, it's interesting, both of my boys play soccer. And give, this is my field. I deal with head injuries. I deal with concussions. And just two years ago on the field, I remember all of a sudden there was no headers. Do you, I don't know if any of you have children, nieces, nephews. but I think about two years ago, it really came out no headers. And I'm on the sideline, and I'm like, OK, come on, get the ball. Let's go do this. Let's go everything exciting. Head, wait, no, we can't do that anymore. Shh, you know, and I'm, I'm sitting here on the sideline like, no headers. And it's so awkward. It's so weird, because you're used to that in soccer. But we're really making a huge shift at prevention, focus injury prevention. So no more headers in, soccers, in soccer, with children at least. So. Rest versus no rest. So typically, in the past, although this is changing, the healthcare professionals have said you need to rest after you have a concussion. After I had my concussion, the doctor said, go home, don't work, just rest. Just let all the signs and symptoms subside when you're feeling better, maybe in a few days or a week. You know, you can start to try to get back to things. Well, research is changing. We're actually showing that you should engage in some type of physical activity. Um, that's a very gray area, by the way. It's not going to be anything vigorous. It's going to be more mild to intermediate activity. You're not jumping back into the field. But research is showing just sitting and resting is not beneficial to the brain. So physical activity is going to improve cognitive function, improve brain health get some normal CSF regulation. So the latest research was physical activity within seven days versus no activity led to decreased post-concussion syndrome. OK? So that's that, that long-term consequence that you do not want to get. It is not fun. It's long-term symptoms. So a little bit of physical activity within the first seven days, again, mild to intermediate and graded is showing improved function and return with concussion. So in addition to the medical management, patients are going to be categorized in three different levels. We've kind of touched on this. Low, moderate, high. So low would be a concussion or the neurologic exam is normal. Moderate is going to be a failure to reach the Glasgow Coma Scale at 15, which is the highest number within two hours. So you're somewhere in the middle. You're not getting all those high scores on the Glasgow Coma Scale. And then high risk is a very low Glasgow Coma Scale of 3 to 8 and focal neurological signs. Okay. Um, in the hospital, intense care, intensive care management would include EEGs, any type of neuromonitoring. That's going to be when you're in the ER and inpatient, and they're monitoring you on acute rehab, making sure that you're safe. And surgical interventions down here, we talked about a craniotomy, and that's what my patient Steve had. 
So they drilled a hole in his brain to decrease the pushing and displacing of his brain, and then they had the blood come out so that the brain tissue can just go back to its normal position, okay? And this just still fascinates me, a craniectomy. This is where they actually remove a flap of your brain. So someone over there, I don't know if he's still here or not, had a really great question about can the tissue go up? And yes, it can, but the skull is so hard, just like the walls of a house, there's nowhere for it to go after a while. So you actually have to cut the skull open and allow the tissue to expand up and out so that it stops pushing down and into the brain. So that's a craniotomy and, or craniectomy, I'm sorry, craniectomy, where you have the flap up. And many patients, as their brain is decreasing swelling, the inflammation's coming down, they actually leave the flap off they stick it in, they have to put it somewhere in their body, and they wear a helmet. Has any of you seen that? A patient with a helmet, and they have to protect their brain because they don't have a skull. Yes, you've seen that? It's scary, huh? I have to work with patients like that. I'm like, I don't want to touch your skull. I don't want to get near your head. I'm so scared. So prognosis. You know this. We talked about this. Remember the Glasgow Coma Scale is the most reliable, simple test to determine your level of consciousness after a brain injury. So it's simple, you know this. If your Glasgow Coma Scale is very low at a three to four, your mortality rate is gonna be really high at 80%. Your disability is gonna be very high and your prognosis is gonna be poor, okay? If you're in the middle, if your Glasgow Coma Scale is eight to 10, Luckily, mortality drop down, drops down very significantly, 15%. Disability drops down quite a bit as well, but you're still in the 50% mark because it's just a, it's a spectrum. 47% and recovery is fair to poor. But when you have a very high Glasgow Coma Scale of, uh, score of 15, mortality goes all the way down to less than 1%. So you are surviving, you are living. Your disability is mild to moderate and your recovery is good. So again, Glasgow Coma Scale, once you find that number, you're gonna be able to tell your patients most likely what their prognosis and recovery will be like. And this is really important. That's a good question. Is there a difference in prognosis between subdural and epidural hematomas? So it would have to be an acute subdural hematoma, because that's the traumatic kind that's similar to epidural hematoma. I don't know that there's a difference. I think it's gonna always depend on the extent of bleeding, extent of the tissue that's displaced, and what tissues are displaced. That's where the neuroanatomy is important. Are there critical parts of the brain that you need to be able to breathe and um, executive functioning, or are there parts maybe where just your vision is affected? But that's a very good question. Again, we talked about 85% of recovery is within the first six months, but not always. And then there's so many other predictive factors. You can't just use this, you know, age, comorbidities, any other health issues, that's gonna really help determine your prognosis. But I do wanna tell you, this is very important for me as a physical therapist. This is important for healthcare professionals because I get asked this question all the time. All of my patients, all of their family members, caregivers, they come to me and they say, Manjuri, can you get me walking again? I just had a patient who's walking tell me, when will I not be able to use my cane anymore? When will I not be able to use my brace anymore? When can I stop using the walker and when can I use a cane? So your patients wanna know the answers. So this is, you have some of the tools here. You'll have to get a little bit more experience, but you have some of the tools here to be able to give them the answers and how nice would it be to say, you're gonna have a really good recovery. And if not, then you work on saying, finding a nice way to say, we're gonna work really hard to get the best recovery that you can. And you hopefully never say, you're never gonna walk again. Maybe it's, you most likely won't walk again, but we'll give it a shot. That's what I try, that's what I try. I hate to say you're never gonna walk again, that's horrible. So we are in the home stretch here. This is Steve, 18 months post-injury, and he is walking on the treadmill. Have any of you seen this body weight supported treadmill system? No? Okay, so I use this in my clinic. So I love this system. 
It's called the body weight supported gait training system. You put a harness on a patient, you strap them up to the top, and that's if they can't walk on their own. So you'll see me. I'm on. I'm on his. I'm on his right foot, and I'm helping. I. This is my job. I sit and I move people's legs. I do other things, but that's a big chunk of what I do. I've got some of my students helping with hip pelvic rotation. We're working really hard, but Steve is walking. This is exciting. So here is Steve. And we are not just passively moving his legs. He's actually initiating the step. He's initiating it. I'm just helping him get his leg forward. I'm trying to teach his body that you can walk again. I'm trying to get that spinal cord, the hips, everything to, to understand what it needs to do. Um, he's using his arm strength to hold on up tight. I mean, this is very challenging for him. We're doing work, but these are the steps you take to get someone walking. Um, what's very interesting about this is at this time, this is pretty intense for him to be able to do this. He was walking 30 minutes on the treadmill with me at 1.2 miles per hour. I know 1.2 doesn't sound huge. You know, we can all probably speed walk to 4.0 on a treadmill, but that 30 minutes, that's a lot of endurance for a man who couldn't even sit at the edge of a mat and hold his head up. He's holding his head up, he's holding his trunk up, he's moving his legs. And 1.2 miles per hour is actually not that bad for where Steve first started. So I'm proud with that. It all has to come together. And if he doesn't have the strength, then he won't be able to walk. But he also has to have that motor control. His brain has to send the signals to the right muscles at the right time to do what they need to do. So that's my job which is fun, which is fun. But yes, that's a very good question. He's atrophied everywhere. And one side is more affected than the other. And you can see it in patients' legs. Their calves get really tiny on one side and then tiny on the other side, but it's asymmetrical. I don't know that I would use the term atrophy for the brain unless it's with, an, with someone who's in a geriatric population. That's when you see more atrophy of the brain. In the brain, what's happening is they're damaged neural tissue and the signals from the brain down to the muscles are not working properly. So that was Steve on the treadmill, but outside of that, at this time, so he does that with me in my therapy sessions, but when he's not on the treadmill, at that time he was walking with a walker, but he couldn't hold on with both arms because he's asymmetrical, one side's weaker than the other. So one arm was in what's called a trough. There's a little trough that his arm sits in like this, and then the other one's holding on because he couldn't hold on. And then he had braces on both legs, but he was walking. And someone was helping him move his legs, hold his hips, but he was actually walking at that time offside, off of the treadmill. So that was his stage. That was his practice at home. And then with me, I walked him on the treadmill. Two and a half years after Steve's injury, this is Steve walking on his own with his dad. Hello. This is why I love my job and my patients. Steve has a brace under his pant leg on the right side. That's his weak side. But that's okay. It's just part of the stages. Isn't that exciting? Yay, Steve is walking. Um, thank you. I haven't had the pleasure of working with Steve recently. I mean, he kind of just took what I gave him and his family was amazing right there with him and they worked hard at home and they would go to gyms and they would come work in my gym even if I wasn't with them. And I heard now he's taking classes. He went to City College somewhere and he is taking classes. I, I, that just completely floors me, but I am so excited for Steve. So I know I will bump into him again, but I haven't seen him for probably a year now, and that was the latest that I heard. Um, this is just a key concept. That's not as exciting as Steve. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, is Steve speaking? So Steve is speaking. It's labored, it's slow, it's 
not as clear and loud, but he sees a speech therapist who works in my clinic. Good question. He sees a speech therapist who works in my clinic. And then we work together. We do co-treatments together. So even though I was doing physical therapy, you heard I was having him count in Spanish. Um, when he was on the treadmill, I'm kind of a mean therapist, but I just, I want to get my patients better. I would hold flashcards while he was walking on the treadmill and make him call out whatever picture he saw in there. And then I'd make him call it out in English and Spanish. And then I was like, louder, I can't hear you. It's too loud in the gym. And he would do it. So yeah, he can speak. He said, hello, Munjuri. How are you? So, but he's getting better. So I know he'll be able to speak more and more and walk more and more independently. So this is what we talked about today, our key concepts. We talked about the neuroanatomy which I love, the protective layers of the brain. We talked about a lot of different types of pathogenesis, contusions, hematomas, concussion. We talked about prognosis. We talked about the key diagnostic tests and the good old Glasgow Coma Scale. This is me and Steve in February of 2016. I attended a brain gala and he was a guest speaker there. And we got all dressed up, and we took this great picture. So that's me and Steve. And I think that's our final slide.